Uh, I'd like to get into uh, our uh, next part uh, for the session. So, so far what has happened is that we have heard from the uh, public sector, right? So we've heard from uh, governments from different uh, continents uh, sharing uh, their uh, views on how they have managed the uh, respective pandemic and also uh, sharing uh, the uh, value proposition on the table for rebuild within their countries. But of course, we know on the other side of that transaction will be the private sector. They will play a key role in that rebuild. And it is only right that we also give them a say, which is what is about to happen right now. We are going to get into a, a high-level uh, business discussion with individuals who have got extensive uh, knowledge on uh, this particular subject matter, matter representing the interests of business, some of them being business people uh, themselves. Let me introduce you to your speakers that will be taking us through uh, this part of the session. Uh, we do have Mr. Peter Robinson, who is the President of the U.S. Council of International Business. We've got Mr. Andrew Wilson, the Head of Global Policy at, in, at the International Chamber of Commerce. We also have Mr. Alfonso Libano Dorella, who is the Vice President of COBEGA, as well as Ms. Karen Picklestein, who is the Vice President at the International Finance Corporation. I had pre uh, prepared to uh, share their brief bios, but just in the interest of time, I think let us get underway with the uh, discussion, and there will always be an opportunity to check uh, them out uh, on, on, on LinkedIn, or if we do have time towards the end, I'm really happy to uh, let you know who was addressing you on this critical matter. So first of all, uh, good afternoon, lady and gentlemen. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we have two main questions that I think are critical to the discussion that we're trying to have right now. And the first question that I'd like to put towards the panelists is what does the business community expect from governments uh, during this uh, COVID-19 crisis still, and of course, after, post-COVID-19, what, what are the main expectations of business? And uh, Karen, I'd like to begin with you. Thank you so much. It's great to be here, and I really appreciate the um, addresses from the government leaders, as well as James's report. Um, but let me just jump in. You know, IFC is the private sector arm of the World Bank Group, and as part of that, um, we're part of the World Bank Group's overall goal um, to really try to prioritize uh, private sector solutions where they can have the most impact at the country level. And so at IFC, what we're doing is trying to focus, uh, looking to 2030, 40% of our investments, which will be about $25 billion, uh, annually by 2030, focusing them on the least developed countries and fragile and conflict-affected states. And so I think when we look at how do you create the opportunity for private sector solutions and FDI and private support to uh, come into these countries, I think one of the big expectations from government is reform in key sectors that will build growth and create jobs. And, so, and then that would allow uh, private companies to come in and uh, support their, the economies. And I think one of IFC's shifts over the past couple of years has really been to shift our strategy towards helping governments do that. So first of all, creating across the World Bank Group what we call private sector diagnostics at the country level, which really demonstrate to government leaders if they were to take reforms in sectors, which would be the sectors that would be have the highest impact in terms of jobs, in terms of growth, and then what reforms would actually be needed to, to remove the obstacles to private investment. So I think a key part of that then links to if we can work with the World Bank, which is our public sector uh, sister, uh, to change uh, the regulations in key sectors, then how can IFC work with the private sector to work what we call upstream to create actual pipelines of bankable investments? Because we've actually seen that about, we think, 10% of global money could actually be moved into impact-related investment to support SDGs, that's about $26 trillion, which is huge. But one of the biggest challenges is finding those vehicles, those platforms, those projects to actually channel that financing into to create actually solutions to development challenges. I just want to say one quick thing, too, about uh, how this strategy of ours shifts during COVID. And it, it doesn't really shift, but in the shorter term, what we've been trying to do is provide liquidity into the markets um, for countries where the government doesn't have the capacity to provide that liquidity necessarily to smaller businesses or to 
financial institutions. So we've been working to support through banks and through trade finance, uh, small businesses so that they can sustain jobs and livelihoods. And then we're moving towards uh, this ability to work upstream on these reform areas and creating bankable projects to solve the challenges and attract private investment back into the emerging economies as we come out of the or as we come out of the pandemic and to help solve the economic challenges. I'll pause there, but uh, that gives a bit of an overview of how we're um, what we're expecting in partnership with government at the country level. Thank you. Uh, and nonetheless, uh, Karen, thanks so much for uh, setting the tone there, uh, just reflecting on the amount of capital that could potentially uh, flow in towards impact investing. Of course, uh, this is a topical theme right now, as it is all about sustainability. We've heard that message being echoed uh, from the start of the session, and I imagine that will end on that note also. Alfonso, I'd like to bring you in now. I mean, as a fellow businessman, uh, what are your expectations from government in the multiple uh, geographies in which you do operate? Uh, the, during the uh, pandemic, as we still grapple with it, of course, post COVID 19. I think we cannot blame. Can you hear me, everybody? Yes. Uh, we, cannot yeah. blame, we cannot blame governments as a unique responsible uh, stakeholder of the actual impact of pandemic or world. It's been a shock for all of us. But the business community first needs action in order to recover the social and economic distress. Most SMEs and family businesses, that which I, which I am from, have had a hard time to survive up to now, and some have disappeared. 30% of the retail business in Spain, for example, is going to disappear. They need better conditions in tax, labor, legislation, and finance, and a better approach sector-wise, especially when we talk about tourism. On the other hand, very restrictive anti-COVID rules uh, applied with a not adequate, not adequate timing mm. have been very unfortunate and have had a human really uh, cost. This could have been avoided. From mm -hmm. now on, we need the governments to take serious learnings because why not? It can happen again. They have to set the right priorities. They need to invest more in advanced social needs, in health and immigration inclusion and education. Education is fundamental. Countries and international organizations should know what to do and their citizenship also. Transparent accountability of countries and international institutions is needed. And mm -hmm. the whole world should be prepared to reduce the impact of a future pandemic in case it happens again. But investment, when I talk about investment, for me, the key drivers will be based on responsible capitalism. I think on ownership. Today onwards, it will be difficult to develop products and projects that are not for the good and for mm -hmm. improvement of life conditions or for the world population's improvement. Mm -hmm. Thanks to the globalization, the knowledge and education upgraded worldwide, and the consumer of worlds worldwide more and more take more sophisticated choices. Business will have to invest in order to improve the portfolio and match the demand. Countries with long-term stable business conditions will take advantage. They will get the finance and the investment needed. Others will suffer. The main concern of finance institutions in order to finance or invest in African projects, where is mainly where I work now, is the high volatility and risk, but not the amount of opportunities. And this is what I have to say about uh, investment at the moment. Okay. Okay. So you'll just take a break there, Adam, at the moment, and we'll come back to you on some of the uh, thoughts that you have raised, uh, you know, pertaining to a more favorable uh, business environment through uh, taxation, uh, particularly and incentives. I'd like to probe you a little bit further on what that threshold looks like. Uh, moving on, but of course, uh, staying with this topic, uh, Peter, as uh, you and I were speaking over the weekend ahead of this presentation, uh, you were uh, reflecting on the amount of years that, of course, you have been involved in, in UNCTAD matters. And just as we all weigh in on uh, the opening uh, question or the opening comment regarding uh, what, what uh, governments uh, should do and what the expectation of business is from government from government in navigating cases. What are your thoughts on this matter? Thanks very much, Fifi. I think uh, I'd like to stress three key messages. 
Uh, one is that the significant drop in FDI due to the pandemic requires action uh, that is focused on an, on an enabling environment where investment is incentivized to encourage economic growth out of the pandemic trough. Uh, secondly, the governments need to provide protection for foreign investors to make it more attractive and need to avoid undue increase in restrictions. And thirdly, that public-private collaboration will be critical for capital market risk-taking, liquidity, price stability, and market functionality. And I would say that, you know, in the, in the years that I've been involved with UNCTAD uh, relating to the fact that we are the U.S. affiliate of the International Chamber of Commerce, as well as business at OECD and the International Organization of Employers, that in this day and age, there's uh, much more of a spirit of collaboration than there was, let's say, four decades ago when a much uh, stronger distrust of business was, uh, was, was gripping us all. But I, I just wanted to especially thank James uh, for his invitation to join this discussion. You know, UNCTAD is widely seen as the go-to source for investment statistics and comprehensive catalog of investment agreements and policy analysis thanks to the great work of his team. And obviously, James, your data that you just presented covers that uh, the global economy is in crisis with a collapse of SDI flows in all directions. An increased investment is just going to be necessary to enable economic recovery up from the pandemic. And we've seen time and time again that an open trade and investment environment leads to growth and development of economies, which will be vital in the rebuilding efforts post-pandemic. And all players, governments, private industry, banks, workers, civil society, have to be working together in this effort. Um, I think that in this context, increasing investment restrictions are not going to be conducive. Any measures imposed during the pandemic should be temporary and narrowly defined. For example, while investment screening for national security reasons may be necessary, those efforts should not cross over into economic protectionism. Uh, also, incentivizing investment to encourage economic and growth and development should be a top priority. In that regard, investment protection will also be vital to encourage as much investment as possible. Markets that provide protection will, to foreign investors are going to be more attractive as investors are making investment decisions. And I might add, we just need to be able to count on strong and effective dispute resolution priority uh, uh, provisions in international investment agreements. So we, in the private sector, look to multilateral institutions like OCTAD to communicate that message and for the member countries to create or maintain that enabling environment for trade and investment in the coming months and years. And obviously, digging deeper to recover from the pandemic, significant amounts of funds are going to be required. The public sector currently does not have the capacity to provide all those funds, so there is a concern in the business community that governments will look to revenue sources that will hamper or chill investment, such as taxation or borrowing. So it'll be uh, a, a tricky uh, a balancing act. But in that vein, as we were talking about before, public-private collaboration is going to be critical to reestablish capital market risk-taking, liquidity, uh, price stability, and market functionality. And if we want to have any hope of digging out of the significant FDI hole that we find ourselves in currently, we'll need that cooperation to complement uh, investment incentivization and adequate uh, investment protection, as I mentioned earlier. Thanks. Yeah. Right. Thanks. And you know, the level of collaboration we have seen it uh, uh, unfold quite strongly uh, since the uh, lockdowns in March uh, between uh, the uh, private sector and the public sector. I don't know how it's been on your side of town, but certainly here in South Africa, it has been uh, quite overwhelming and, and in fact heartwarming to see the level of collaboration between these two agents who are sometimes not on the uh, same side, but coming on the same side and fighting one common enemy. And I would agree with you that in terms of Open recovery and reconstruction, that level of collaboration needs to be part of the way going forward. But Anthony, just to bring you in here on your opening remarks, 
as to uh, the the expectations of business in this environment right now, where FDI is is is, is scarce. Scar- I mean, the amount of capital that they in themselves have to invest in areas is, is a lot less than they had initially thought, perhaps this time next year. So, in your conversations with some of the businesses that uh, you you do represent at the ICC, what what are what 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 does business want? Uh, from government uh, to help uh, government in the recovery and the reconstruction process, in your view? So, Fifi, thank you. So, I think the, the, the beauty of going last on a panel like this is I can just really agree with everything that has already been said <laughs> by Karen and, and Peter. And, and certainly, you know, there's nothing through this crisis that has changed the fundamental drivers, per se, of, of FDI. But perhaps just give it a slightly different and perhaps more short-term perspective. I think one of the the challenges we see is the absolute imperative for sound and and strengthened economic cooperation, particularly amongst the G20, firstly to bring the pandemic to an orderly close, but also really to stabilize the economic foundations. And absent of that happening, um, there's a real fundamental question, I think, people talk about build back better, but from what basis are we going to be ultimately building back? So first on bringing the pandemic to an orderly close, I think that the best investment any government can make or advanced government can make is the investment in capitalizing the WHO's access to COVID-19 tools accelerator and specifically to ensure full capitalization of the vaccine pillar to to ensure that there is equitable global access to uh, COVID-19 vaccines. And we know from all the, the economic analysis that has been conducted today, we also know from speaking directly to businesses throughout our network, that uneven distribution of the vaccine will weigh significantly on trade and investment into 2021 and beyond. And that was an absolute imperative to ensure that the pandemic is not just brought to an end in the G7, but actually brought to an end globally in a measured and properly coordinated way. The second thing then is really to, and I think Karen touched on this wonderfully, is really to ensure that small businesses in particular receive sufficient support, fiscal support through the crisis. And we are seeing worrying signs in terms of the data we we have from our global network that small business uh, failure rates are increasing and are trending way above the the modeling uh, that the IMF is using, for instance. In Colombia, we're seeing failure rates of around 60, 60 percent above uh, pre-pandemic levels, accounting for seasonal fluctuations. And that is a real concern that we're seeing this attrition of the small business community, which could have long-term scarring effects in terms of the productive capacity of economies, and obviously knock on long-term effects in terms of the attractiveness of economies from an FDI perspective. And then the final thing I just want to say is, is we clearly need action to resolve the debt overhang in, in emerging economies coming out of this crisis. And I think it's a, a dangerous hypothesis for people to play with to say, well, if governments manage their public finances effectively and put in place the right sorts of regulatory reforms to increase inward investment, boost productive capacity, then governments will just be able to grow out of, of the debt crisis we now face. That has only happened once in history previously, which is Imperial Britain after the Napoleonic Wars. There's no uh, real evidence to suggest it can happen again. And the risk of a debt overhang, the risk of periodic debt crises is clearly something that will weigh on FDI inflows if the, uh, or unless rather the G20 chooses to actually do something about this and actually resolve the debt crisis in a holistic way coming out of the pandemic. So short-term actions in those three areas on debt, on SME support and ultimately on vaccine access are absolutely vital to provide the foundations for a business-led and investment-led recovery coming out of the crisis. It's uh, changing shifts here. So whoever went last is going first and whoever went first is going last. So Andrew, that means that you will uh, usher us <laughs> into our next discussion, which you have already actually touched on. And I'd like you perhaps to expand um, on 
on what the uh, private sector and organizations like UNCTAD need to be doing uh, to facilitate the, the recovery of these economies, to stimulate the, uh, the investments and also to channel funds in the correct areas. And perhaps if you can touch on a question that has come from uh, the audience, uh, really asking specifically for developing nations, uh, which James did share, you know, were amongst the uh, hardest hit in terms of seeing a reduction in FDI flows. What I'd say is, and it's probably a sort of continuation of, of my initial response or my own remarks, I think clearly from an emerging market perspective, there is a need for international cooperation. We can't just expect that economies will automatically or naturally rebound, even with the best intentions in terms of uh, domestic policy reforms. So I think international cooperation, particularly on debt relief and also on fiscal support, will be absolutely essential in the short term and also in the in the mid term. I think going forward, and I think this is something that came out in a number of the, the opening remarks, we really do need to think more effectively about impact in terms of investment and how we bend FDI flows into greater alignment with the Sustainable Development Goals. I think partly there we've seen some incredibly promising work from the IFC, the World Bank and others. Um, but I think one thing that needs to come out is, is clearer metrics regarding impact. We're involved in a project with the UN uh, Development Program called SDG Impact, looking at how to measure the impact around uh, certain investments. I think that, that is promising and I think ultimately what we need, uh, well, ultimately what we've seen I think through this crisis is that Businesses are hugely dependent on governments when times are bad. I think it's only only natural coming out of this crisis, and I think there's a, a total recognition of this within the private sector, that there will be a question then coming out of the crisis around the social contract between business, governments, and society. So I think the, the, the absolute goal of aligning investment with sustainable development, with the needs of local economies, will be absolutely vital and I think it's, it's essential that we all enter the, the post-pandemic rebuild with a shared goal of actually ensuring proper full alignment, not just 10%, 20% of the market, but 80, 90, 100% of the market in terms of getting investment into line with the, the commonly agreed uh, SDGs from 2015. Agreed, to Andrew, you are off the hook then for now. Uh, Peter, just your thoughts on this uh, second uh, question on the role, of course, of the private sector and institutions like uh, UNCTAD and, and WIPA in, in helping channel these funds towards a more sustainable uh, development. Uh, you know, a lot is being said about how businesses, of course, need to be thinking about investments differently and uh, it needs to be about the, 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 the people and, and, and the, the planet and, and, and the community, of course. Uh, but a lot of businesses are right now in, in my parts of the world are just, you know, trying to survive. And uh, it, it, it does seem like a lot to be uh, putting on business right now that is just essentially trying to keep the lights on. So just your view on how this current situation can be a better navigated from the private sector's point of view and of course from the um, international uh, pers uh, international organization's point of view in in working together better to support some of this development um, uh, yeah I think it goes back to the issue of, of making sure that we all work together so that private investors are attracted to uh, investment opportunities that are going to be able to um, uh, help bring us all forward as an economy and, and society. And I think it's, you know, we, we have to remember uh, to a certain extent that, you know, when an investor, large or small, uh, invests in a foreign market, they're, they're putting themselves at, and their resources at the mercy of another sovereign government. So I think it's really critical that we have and try to facilitate and build together and ensure you know, between business and governments uh, strong rule of law environments uh, that include strong investment uh, protections in international investment agreements uh, as well as effective dispute 
settlement provisions and notes agreements, just to give investors, especially at this time, more confidence that they can and come in and, uh, and, and uh, uh, invest in, in, a, in a constructive uh, way. And I think that as part of that, um, governments and, and investment uh, promotion agencies can really play a vital role by providing you know, information on business conditions in, in the host country and helping to co connect uh, potential investors uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, promising opportunities. And also to, to link investors, large or small, uh, with potential suppliers and service providers uh, to find uh, financing options. To get your thoughts on this, and also the, uh, the, some of the points that you did raise, of course, in your opening remarks about um, an enabling environment for, for some businesses, you did share some shocking insights and statistics about uh, the, the Spanish economy and the amount of businesses there that were in trouble. You know, uh, the, the role of some of these agents and um, investment promotion agencies in aiding the, the recovery, and also specifics on uh, how, you know, policy can shape a more conducive environment. You were talking about a favorable tax, uh, or favorable taxes. What, what does that look like in, in numbers terms? Uh, you were talking about incentives. Uh, what, what are they? If you could just flesh those out for us a little bit clearer. First, to understand, Alfonso. Yes, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say, as I'm a member of the family business community, I have to say that more or less 60% of the employment worldwide is uh, from small and medium enterprises. And from these small and medium enterprises, like 80 or 90% are family businesses. So we have to take care of them, we have to help them to get the right size. No? And I would say, for example, that. Uh, I've been investing in Africa for 40 years now, also in Asia and in Europe. No, uh, we, I would say that my uh, uh, bottler of a um, main brand that uh, we sell about 30% of the sales worldwide. So I know quite well most places. But I, I'm going to concentrate a bit more on, on the African continent. I think that is good for everyone. Huh? I mean, I think the first thing is that what I said, you have to to focus your future in a responsible ownership and capitalist principles and standards. There's no more way, there's no way I can move for other other kind of projects going for the short term profit and that's that's all. Um, ethics are very important. Long term projects um, cannot succeed if they don't cover social and economic ambitions. The other concept also that is very important is to share value added between companies and local communities and a continuous dialogue with local local authorities. I think if you want to develop and you want to grow, you have to talk with the country and you have to really agree in the long-term basis. <clears throat> Sustainability and achievements are basic platform in order to develop measurement standards in order to improve some cases of in dramatic situations. No? Um, we need also the help of local administrations and the, and the interna international institutions, also surveillance. When we talk about taxes, uh, for example, in Africa, is a challenge. 86% 80, of the African economy is informal. Sub-Saharan countries are only around, give only, are only, have only 60% of the taxes are of the GDP. And this goes for a few that don't stay for long term because just they bankrupt. It's not viable. This is also part of the cause of corruption, which costs the African continent around 50 billion a year. And corruption is all over the world. It's something very serious that we have to solve. We need to increase the GDP of the countries in order to increase the size of the small and medium enterprises, to invest in order to have a better tax administration, and then have more tax taxpayers. It's very important that we don't charge the tax in big multinationals, in long-term projects, but also in all taxpayers. That costs between 1% or 4% of the whole tax. I know it's costly, but it will organize better the country. Tax investment, tax systems in order to improve, to improve tax uh, uh, money for the countries is very important. I think the rich, diversified African culture, and also the nation now that we are, that doesn't make it easy in order to build African 
economy, uh, global economy and social policies will be as strong as it in the future. I think local values, when you have a lot of local values, will take advantage from, local, from global actions because there is a lot of wealth on it. I mean, you can get a lot of it if you have a good global global action and guidance. It's fundamental to build locally and agreed international guidance. All right. It's very important in order to have a stable framework for small and medium enterprises to grow in several uh, several places. Okay, so, Alfonso, I'll stop you there. I'll stop you there. Just hang on to some of your concluding thoughts, which we can uh, potentially uh, get to as we uh, conclude this discussion. There has been a couple of questions that have come from the uh, panel, and I'm hoping, uh, from the audience rather, and I'm hoping to get uh, to them and to give them to you guys as well. Uh, Karen, before we do go into a Q&A, just your thoughts on the the last topic. I'll just speak uh, briefly about the investment promotion agencies and the work that we're doing um, to engage them, especially in this uh, COVID uh, pandemic situation that they're facing, and then talk about a couple of the things that we're doing to try to really bring uh, private sector in, both in this sort of relief phase, but then looking toward how, toward how we recover more resiliently. So on the investment promotion agencies, um, the World Bank Group, we're working with almost 100 agencies around the world. And at IFC, we're managing 55 of those projects. And I think one of the key things that we're looking at is how do we uh, start new agencies in countries that don't have them? How do we build capacity uh, for the older uh, agencies, especially in light of the pandemic situation? And we're seeing a real shift in the work that they're doing as well towards retaining investment in addition to attracting investment during this tough time. And so I think one of the things that we're seeing um, in our work is also an increasing work on what we would call aftercare services. So after investors have come into the country, how do we keep them in the country? And how does the, the investment promotion agency work on that agenda? So we're seeing, for example, in Jordan, their investment promotion agency is working more online to communicate um, and deliver its services around, you know, what are changes in regulations, what's happening to support investors. And for example, Ethiopia, um, their agency is using social media more to communicate during the, the COVID uh, time. And so I think this is just showing, you know, we're, we've put together a toolkit where we can work with investment promotion agencies to help them make this transition during the pandemic and the, the ongoing economic crisis. Um, I think when we look at, you know, what we've been doing to try to look again at examples of bringing in foreign investment, one area, and James referred to this, um, quite a bit was the global value chains. And one that we've been focused on is the, the health sector and healthcare sector, which is so crucial to the recovery. And there we're really looking at what role the private sector can and should be playing. About half of medical services and healthcare are provided in emerging markets or uh, developing countries uh, through the private sector. So how do we strengthen that role, especially in terms of getting affordable PPE and eventually vaccines, um, made available to our client countries across the emerging markets. So there we've put together a $4 billion platform where we expect to invest $2 billion and we're hoping to engage other investors in uh, mobilizing $2 billion from the market and from strategic investors. So I think that's a key way that we're working right now um, to help in the healthcare sector in emerging markets. The other area we've been working, and I mentioned just quickly Ethiopia, um, you know, we've been working on um, the Build Back Resiliently, and we're going to put 35% of our investments into climate-linked um, green finance. The other thing that we're trying to do is build out sectors like uh, renewable energy. So we've got a scaling solar program that started in Zambia, where we helped with the World Bank to mitigate some of the, the risks um, for the offtake of the power, for getting land um, for the projects and for the tariff policy. And we did that first in, in Zambia, and then we built that out in Ethiopia, Madagascar, and in um, Senegal. And what that's allowed us to do is really bid out projects and that have been de-risked uh, by the World Bank Group and based on government policy reforms as well. And so in, in the case of uh, Zambia, we brought in Enel from Italy to take on that solar concession after they won the bid. So these are just examples of what we're trying to do to bring uh, the foreign investors into emerging markets as part of this resilient recovery. Thanks. 
All right. Thank you. Thanks uh, so much, Karen. Uh, sorry to interrupt there. It's just that we are running out of time. And I am going to ask the panelists, because we've got quite a quick number of questions that have come through from the audience. I'm going to ask you to be very brief in your responses. I try, if possible, to keep your response to a minute, just really highlighting the salient point of the question. And Karen, I actually want to say on you for this question, because it is something that you touched on briefly. And it was about the, um, the use of the e-investment forums and uh, platforms that some countries had been making use of. I think you had mentioned Ethiopia. And uh, there, there's a question from the panel regarding the physical investment uh, uh, platforms and whether they still have a place, particularly for developing nations in your view. Well, I think prior to the crisis, um, you know, our investment promotion work, I think Ethiopia brought in about a billion dollars worth of um, investment, and I think about 20% of that was work that we were involved in. And I think what we're seeing is this combination of policy reform in sectors that can really um, add value foundationally to the economy, whether it's um, the uh, power sector, whether it's transport, whether it's uh, telecoms, and then really creating the conditions as I was describing so that when investors bid, they're really looking at uh, projects that are built on a sound reform platform, which will support uh, bringing them in sustainably and doing it in a way that's transparent. And these opportunities can be bid out to the best investors um, possible to support uh, the country level intervention. Perfect. Uh, Peter, to come back to you, because you did touch on uh, the issue of uh, privatization um, at, uh, d during your response, and there's a question that has come through uh, from the audience about uh, nationalism. And uh, given the increase in nationalism that we are seeing, uh, how will FDI attraction, in your view, and also the, pit the, the pitching of FDI change? Peter? I think nationalism is a big threat to um, FDI, and we have to all work together to do our best to, to counter it. And that's why we need strong, effective multilateral institutions like, like UNCTAD, IFC, and others to, to help pave the way and to create the more uh, you know, a platform of trusted dialogue, in this case, between governments and, and private sectors. and uh, to encourage governments to really do everything they can rather than to uh, set up uh, restrictions to, to, to uh, create better rule of law um, environments that will uh, be attractive to investors as investors look to you know where they where they can best make a, an impact around the world. Alfonso, there is a question that I'm hoping that you can uh, answer from a personal perspective. And it is a, a question around, or that did come, if you could just allow me to find it for just a moment. It did come from Latin America. And the question is, what do you think that Latin American uh, TTOs are supposed to do in order to enhance FDI levels uh, in our country? So just uh, briefly, if you can just keep the response to a minute. Sorry, but well, I think that South America has a very important uh, part of uh, in economy in our world nowadays. I think today the South American development and, and uh, taking advantage of the trade agreements together in South America and North America and also with Europe will really boost the economy if we have we know to do how to do it. For example, we have also the same thing, same in Africa of ECOWAS and AFTA. I think the trade agreements have to be pushed in order to uh, help uh, intercontinent trading, in order to help uh, pandemic, the pandemic situation to be solved. Uh, this is very important. Administration has to help in order to make it easy, in order to buy and sell from one continent to other, to others, in, in order to, to achieve this, 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 this this possible commerce that we should uh, boost the fair commerce between uh, both continents. And in the South American have a lot to offer uh, for the rest of the world, as the Africans have a lot to offer between the countries and for the rest of the world. So these uh, trade agreements should be pushed as much as we can nowadays, and also transport. 
which is important. There's a lack of community transport, of shipping, of uh, uh, transport, and uh, that we need to solve if we want the people to recover and to, to come again to the previous situation. Perfect, and thank you uh, once again for keeping your responses brief. Uh, if I can just get to Andrew uh, for the uh, final question that we are able to take uh, during the session. Uh, if we haven't been able to get to any of your uh, questions, please do not despair. Uh, we do have another session tomorrow where a lot of questions uh, will be carried over to tomorrow's session, and uh, you will get your responses uh, then. But Andrew, if you can just close us off here. Uh, the South, uh, South Africa has a prerogative on outward investment, uh, particularly as we approach the advent of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement that I believe is set to take uh, in effect in, in January. Uh, th th this, we'll see how COVID-19 plays out. But, uh, Andrew, what do you think or what support should international organizations afford uh, to grow this pipeline? So, Vivi, I think the, the Continental Free Trade Agreement is a very good example um, in the sense of in the sense of really looking at what I think is, a, if you like, the dichotomy coming out of this crisis. Do governments choose to retreat behind national borders, uh, limit foreign investment, limit international trade, introduce capital controls, or do they choose openness, and do they choose openness as a means of promoting resilience? So, we would see implementation of the, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement from the start of next year. It's actually a really important test case in terms of how uh, continental integration in this case can actually be a driver of resilience. So I think we're seeing some really uh, encouraging signs uh, from the Secretariat of the, of the agreement in terms of actually looking at, for instance, is digitization or, or digitization of trade processes a means of actually enabling the African continent to leapfrog uh, forward in terms of uh, its position in the global trading system. So we would see not just the emphasis necessarily on outward flows of FDI, but a means of actually using agreements such as the Continental Free Trade Agreement as a way of really proving that openness is a pathway to resilience and that the alternative of, of retreat and ultimately protectionism is actually the wrong way for governments to go in responding to the midterm effects of the crisis. Uh, thank you there, Andrew, and I hope that uh, did uh, answer the uh, question for the uh, panelists who for the audience member, of course, who posed that question. And that is where we wrap up this uh, discussion. I'd like to thank all our panelists, uh, Karen, Peter, Andrew, Alfonso, for your insights, and I believe that you adequately did represent the interests of business.